Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Liz Pimper, and I'll be your moderator for today's WJE webinar, New York City's Facade Inspection Safety Program, Overview and Notable 2020 Amendments. During the next hour, WJE experts Michelle Dahlhoff and, and Tom Kuchensky will detail the necessary planning required to fulfill the new requirements that took effect on February 20th of this year, as well as notable amendments to access requirements, penalties, and the newly added cavity wall probe stipulation. Before we begin, I'd like to highlight several features of the webinar console that you may find useful. All of the tools on your screen are expandable and movable, so feel free to adjust them to get the most out of your screen space. Please type your questions in the Q&A tool at any time. Questions related to the presentation will be addressed during the Q&A period toward the end of the hour. Any questions related to troubleshooting or regarding the webinar platform will be addressed in real time. This presentation is copyrighted by Wes Janney Elsner Associates. And now I will turn it over to Michelle to get us started. Michelle? Thank you, Liz. And thank you to everyone for joining Tom and I today as we discuss New York City's facade ordinance, also known as the Facade Inspection Safety Program, or FISP, which we'll refer to it throughout the, pre the presentation as. Today's learning objective. By the end of the presentation, you will be able to describe the FISP inspection and filing requirements, plan and budget for the recent changes to access requirements, effectively schedule inspections and report filings to avoid civil penalties, and evaluate alternate means for up-close inspections, such as aerial lifts and rope access techniques. During today's presentation, we will discuss the background of this ordinance, how it came to be, and the various iterations following that, review what buildings are under this requirement, detail the nuts and bolts of typical inspection and filing requirements, review facade filing status classifications, including safe, unsafe, and swarm, review typical filing fees and penalties, and we will finish up by detailing some of the building owner responsibilities and re recommended potential next steps for building owners, co-op boards, managing agents, and anyone involved in buildings that this ordinance applies to. New York City's first facade ordinance, and for that matter, the first ordinance mandating routine facade inspections anywhere, was enacted in 1980 under Local Law 10. This was unfortunately enacted following the death of Grace Gold, a Barnard student struck by a piece of falling masonry in Upper Manhattan. Local Law 10 required routine inspection of the street-facing building walls on buildings greater than six stories. Later, in 1998, Local Law 11 was enacted, requiring inspections not just of street-facing facades, but all off-street facades as well. The more recent Facade Inspection Safety Program, enacted in 2013, also increased attention to balcony and railing inspections. The current iteration of this was amended on February 20th of this year with new amendments that we will detail throughout the presentation. The ordinance is specified within New York Construction Code along with the New York City uh, Rules of the City of New York, 10304 which we will cite throughout this presentation. Is your building impacted? All New York City buildings, that being buildings located within the five boroughs that are above six stories, require inspections. That being a building that is six stories with a basement that is a lower level partially above grade would require an inspection. Buildings with a lower level, such as a cellar, completely below grade, do not. Overall, these requirements impact 14,000 buildings throughout the city. Prior to Cycle 7, the earlier iterations of this ordinance required that all buildings fulfilling the six-story and above requirement would file, would 
perform inspections and, per and file associated reports every five years. Starting in cycle seven, these filings were divided into sub-cycles, two-year windows. The sub-cycle of your building is determined by the last digit of the block number, as shown here under sub-cycles A, B, and C. These sub-cycles occur over a five-year rolling clock window. Here, you can see cycle nine, which we are currently within, having opened February 21st of this year, is a two-year period, starting this year and ending February 21st of 2022. Knowing which building you may fall into within the cycle is very important for scheduling of work, which we'll discuss later. I will now turn it over to Tom to discuss some of the inspector requirements. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so who performs these inspections specifically? Um, in New York City, we have what are called Qualified Exterior Wall Inspectors, or QEWI for short. Uh, they are registered design professionals, either an architect or an engineer, who must have at least seven years of relevant experience with facade inspections. These individuals are approved by and certified by the Department of Buildings through an interview uh, and oral test process. Um, and they are registered with the DOB, and they are the only ones that can uh, perform these inspections or oversee these inspections and file the FISP reports. Of course, the QEWI is only one person, uh, so they are permitted to have secondary inspectors that work directly under the QEWI's supervision. These secondary inspectors uh, must have a degree, a uh, bachelor's degree in architecture or engineering and three years of relevant uh, facade inspection experience. Or if they do not have a degree, they must have five years of relevant experience performing facade inspections. So what are the different types of inspections that are required? Initially, we have visual inspections, which are generally performed from street level or adjoining buildings uh, these inspections are typically performed using binoculars and high-powered telephoto lenses on cameras, uh, and they are performed in order to visually assess 100% uh, of the facade or as much of the facade as possible on all sides of the building. In addition to the visual inspections, close-up inspections are performed, uh, and these entail hands-on surveys of the facade from body, bottom to top um, using whatever access means uh, is deemed necessary. Now, new as of 2020, as of February of this year, cycle nine, uh, these close-up inspections are now required to be performed at intervals of no more than 60 feet at each public-facing uh, facade. This is a new requirement as of this year. Previously, there were only, it was only necessary to perform a minimum of one drop inspection on a street-facing facade. So as you can guess, the number of minimum close-up inspections uh, necessary is determined by the length of facade you have facing the public way. So if you have between 180 feet and 240 feet of public facing facade, for example, you would be required to perform a minimum of four inspections. Now, as you can imagine, there's a lot of buildings that do not have a typical square or rectangular footprint. So it might be a little confusing uh, understanding the number of close-up inspections that would be required. Uh, these are diagrams that were provided by the Department of Buildings to clarify this. Uh, as you can see in case two on the right, there are five separate facades that face the public way, A, B, C, D, and E. In order to determine the number of inspections that are required, you simply add up the length of all of these facades and divide by 60. So if the length of those five street-facing facades adds up to, for example, between 180 feet and 240 feet, you only need to do four drop inspections or close-up inspections. Another important point for the QEWI and these visual and close-up inspections is that the visual inspection is typically done prior to the close-up inspection so that the QEWI can identify conditions uh, that they may uh, opt to look, get a closer look at during their close-up inspections. They may take their visual inspection and use that information to determine where exactly they want to do the close-up inspections as long as they're meeting the 60-foot requirement. 
Now, how are these close-up inspections performed? There's a number of different ways. Traditionally, swing stage scaff scaffolding has been used. Um, it should be known that all of, these, all of these means of access will require some form of contractor assistance, whether it's for setting up and operating the swing stage scaffolding, operating house rigs using the building mechanic, uh, or setting up pipe frame scaffolding. Using pipe frame scaffolding for these types of inspections is rare because uh, it tends to be more costly for owners and building managers. Uh, however, in some cases, when buildings fall in a cycle and there's still an ongoing project at the building, pipe frame scaffolding is a great option for up-close access and it gives you access to a lot of area of the facade. In recent years, alternative means have been used, such as rope access and aerial lifts for these close-up inspections. There's aerial lifts out there now that can reach heights up to 300 feet in the air. They are truck mounted. Um, and again, these contractors would assist in operating these, machine, these pieces of machinery and acquiring the necessary DOT permits uh, to perform these inspections. It should be known that if you're using an aerial lift that has a limited height, that 100% of the height of the building needs to be inspected. So if you have a 200 foot aerial lift and a 300 foot tall building, that would not satisfy the requirements of the code. Rope access techniques are also another great option for performing these inspections, especially since the frequency of inspections has increased. Uh, the individuals that perform these rope access inspections need special certifications. And specific to New York City, they need to be overseen by not, some, not only someone who has these rope access uh, certifications, but they also must be a licensed reader. Now, the importance of these up-close inspections is so that it can allow the QEWI to sound and touch and assess these uh, different types of building materials uh, and possibly identify uh, hidden distress conditions that would not otherwise have been known uh, purely through the visual inspection from the street. The close-up inspections also allow for the use of supplemental non-destructive tools, such as metal detectors, ground penetrating radar, or boroscope cameras. As an example, in the photo on the left, you can see a crack that's on the top side of a water table. This condition, uh, this photo is, view, is viewed looking downwards. Uh, this condition would not otherwise have been seen from the street visually with binoculars, and the close-up inspection was able to identify this. And depending on the condition of the surrounding materials and how sound they are, this condition would be identified as either safe with a repair or maintenance program uh, or possibly unsafe. And just as an example on the right, you can see the complexities in some of the buildings we have around here. Uh, just the intricacies in some, of these, in some of these ornamentation elements cannot possibly be assessed with any kind of certainty without getting up close access. Also required as part of the FISP inspection program is an assessment of all guards and railings on a building. This includes balcony railings, it includes rooftop perimeter railings, uh, fire escape railings, fire tower railings, anything that's on the outside of the building. Uh, it should be important to understand that this is not a code compliance check. This is a public safety inspection. So the QEWI will review these railings and ensure that their components are positively secured and that they're sound and in good condition. Some QEWIs, depending on the existing conditions, might opt to perform some sort of load test on the railing. They may follow the, co the structural code standards uh, for these railings to perform that load test uh, in order to assist with their inspection and their assessment of an existing railing. It should also be known that if any guard or railing, balcony enclosure, or greenhouse structure is found not to be positively secured, the condition is classified as unsafe and must be made safe. And that is per RCNY 10304. Another new addition to the 2020 rules uh, as of February of this year are probes in cavity walls. Now, a cavity wall could be any type of masonry, uh, whether it's brick or stone, uh, with an open space behind it and a, backup, and a backup structure such as concrete masonry unit or concrete. These masonry veneers are typically tied back to that backup structure using some sort of veneer tie, uh, typically a metal tie. Uh, and they will be at a given space. 
The new rules as of this year require that probes are performed or a single probe is performed per close-up inspection location. So as you can imagine, if you have three close-up inspection uh, drops, you will be required to do a minimum of three probes, one at each of those drops. Now the QEWI will perform that inspection of that probe in order to assess the condition of the existing veneer ties. The purpose is to not only measure the spacing of the ties, but also to assess their engagement with the veneer and their condition, whether it's uh, the extent of corrosion or if they were not originally engaged to begin with. It should also be, be understood that these probes are required in the ninth cycle, and once they are performed in the ninth cycle, they are performed at 10-year intervals. So there will not be probes required in the 10th cycle, but they will be required again in the 11th cycle. It should also be understood that probes cannot be performed at areas that have been previously repaired. Uh, there are some exceptions to whether probes are necessary. If there was a repair campaign specifically addressing the cavity wall ties that was completed within 10 years of the filing deadline for the FISC report, then the probes are not necessary. Or if it's a new building and the certificate of occupancy uh, was issued within 10 years of the filing deadline, then the probes are not necessary. Or the QEWI may propose an alternative method of determining the tie condition and spacing, which must be submitted and approved uh, by the Department of Buildings. And now I'm going to hand it back to Michelle to discuss the different building status types. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I will now detail the various classifications for building facades, which there are three of. First is a safe with a repair and maintenance plan, or SWAR. It's defined within RCNY as a condition of a building, any appurtenance thereto, or any part thereof that is safe at the time of inspection but requires repairs or maintenance during the next five years, but not less than one year, in order to prevent its deterioration into an unsafe condition during that five-year period. Examples of potential swarm conditions or safe with repair and maintenance can be seen here. On the left is a travertine cladding condition with a ferrous anchor. You can see the staining from corrosion buildup. This is a condition that, assuming during the scope of survey, if the perimeter panels were sounded and everything was intact and there were no immediate concerns, that this would be something noted for repair in the coming years. This repair would be to avoid any further corrosion that could potentially crack the travertine, um, cause some sort of movement or displacement, potentially creating an unsafe condition. On the right, you can see something very typical to New York facades, uh, weathered and deteriorated, deteriorated brick masonry joints. Again, assuming that no unsafe conditions were discovered, all sounding um, proved that things were generally intact, uh, this might be a condition that would be noted for future repairs, likely repointing and removal and replacement of any cracked or delaminated brick conditions. If a building is classified as swarm, it's generally considered safe right now, but it needs repairs to ma maintain so. If there are any imminent hazards, the building cannot be, be classified as safe with repair and maintenance. A very important thing to note that is during one cycle, perhaps during cycle eight, if a condition is noted as safe as repair and maintenance, it must be repaired prior to filing in cycle nine. No conditions can carry over between inspections. If a condition were to carry over, it would automatically be classified as unsafe. Unsafe is def defined within the RCNY as a condition of a building wall, any appurtenance thereto, or any part thereof that is hazardous to persons or property and requires repair within one year of completion of critical examination. In addition, 
any condition that was reported as swamp in a previous report that is not corrected at the time of current inspection must there be reported as an unsafe condition. These images show potentially unsafe conditions. On the left, we have a terracotta unit that has been previously repaired with questionable means. Um, it is likely completely separate, separated from the substrate with only this sealant keeping it in place. This would be classified as unsafe because in addition to having improper repair methodologies implemented, there's no way to say that how long that this unit will stay intact or what change in weather or conditions would cause it to become free and, and cause a hazard to anyone below. The image on the right shows a more severe condition of brick masonry deterioration and joint loss than the prior image. Um, large areas of mortar are missing, large cracks span between joints, and it's likely that many of these brick units are potentially loose. And if not yet loose, um, any further weathering, um, erosion due to freeze-thaw, uh, water cycling, any of those things could cause this to further deteriorate and come loose and provide a potential hazard. Additional unsafe conditions. On the left, we see a concrete stall, that being a piece of material that has cracked and become, be, started to become loose from the substrate. Um, this is frequently in a lot of facade materials due to corrosion of underlying reinforcement or structural steel elements. If, if left um, in place, this piece could come loose and fall below. On the right-hand side, we see a full-depth crack of a travertine unit. Um, you can see there's a couple of areas that are cracked through, creating shards, and you can also see movement. Both of these conditions are certainly unsafe and need immediate action to prevent any further deterioration or hazards. If there is at least one unsafe condition in any building, the building facade, the entire facade must be classified as unsafe. If a QE during the, um, their survey work discovers an unsafe condition, immediate actions must be taken. One being the QE must notify the city and then the owner, so the owner can immediately arrange for and procure necessary safety provisions. That those safety means might include erection of a sidewalk shed, a construction fence, um, netting of potentially hazardous areas, whatever is necessary to protect the public. Owners must also repair dangerous conditions within 90 days of filing a technical report and file an amended report within two weeks of correction. It should be noted that oftentimes 90 days is too short of a time to fully implement necessary repairs. That can be largely impacted by the size of the building, the nature of the conditions observed, the quantity of the conditions, and whatever associated filing and access coordination that may be necessary. With that in mind, there are, there are paperwork filings that, that can be submitted to the DOB to extend upon that initial 90-day filing and we'll discuss those further. Ideally, your building will be filed as safe, that being that the building appurtenances, all, all the wall elements were observed to be intact with no immediate repair recommendations and nothing anticipated to become unsafe over the next five years. Uh, it's important to note that buildings with any ongoing construction cannot be classified as safe. Uh, any ongoing work would still be swamp or potentially unsafe until any noted conditions are completed. Only when there are no unsafe and no swarm conditions can the building be fully classified as safe. Once the QE has reviewed the building, both visually and close up, um, 
performed probes as appropriate if there are cavity wall construction elements, reviewed guardrails, and reviewed the results of their survey and any noted conditions with ownership, ownership representation, management, whatever involved parties there may be, they then go to the DOB Safety Now portal. This is where all filings are now processed. Previously, they had been done with paper and filed in person with the DOB, but now all filings have mitigated to this new online portal system. Here, the QE enters the dates of survey, the building status, the types of conditions and materials noted, recommended timelines for repairs, and then supporting documents, such as plans and drawings showing the scope of survey, uh, areas of conditions noted, and subject photos. Now I'll turn it back to Tom to detail some of the filing fees. Thank you, Michelle. I will touch briefly on the filing fees and the, and the changes to those fees from previous uh, years. Uh, the initial filing fee is still $265 per report. Uh, that is uh, set across all, all reports, regardless of, of your building type, whether it's safe, unsafe, or swarm. That is the filing fee. Um, as Michelle had mentioned, there is an option for filing for extensions of time to correct conditions. Uh, there is an application fee of $135 uh, to apply for that extension. Uh, it should be noted that there is a proposal uh, on, on the table uh, to increase these two fees to $425 and $305 respectively, uh, but that hearing for that, those proposed increases has been uh, postponed in recent times, uh, but we uh, building owners and, and managers should expect uh, those, those fees to increase uh, in the future. Now, if the building fails to file a report, there is a $5,000 initial penalty plus $1,000 per month until the report is filed. Additionally, if a building has unsafe conditions, there is a $1,000 per month fee uh, assigned to that building for that failure to correct. On top of that, after the first year of failing to correct an unsafe condition, and there's a sidewalk shed out front of the building to provide public safety, there is a $10 per linear foot of shed charged to the building. That fee increases by $10 every subsequent year. As you can see, the DOB is emphasizing that buildings address unsafe conditions in a timely manner. Uh, and by increasing these fees and penalties, we are all hoping that uh, they follow suit. Now, the owner is responsible for hiring the QEWI. The QEWIs will have the knowledge and expertise to guide the owners through this process. Uh, but ownership and building managers should be aware that they are responsible for hiring these, these people, uh, as well as the contractors needed uh, to facilitate the access, the assessment, and to document these conditions. The owners are also responsible for filing the facade reports as detailed in RCNY 10304, which means making the deadline uh, and, and facilitating these inspections. The owner is also responsible for repairing any dangerous conditions within 90 days of filing an unsafe technical report. And again, as Michelle mentioned earlier, uh, an unsafe condition that's identified by QEWI is immediately uh, made, made aware to the, to the Department of Buildings and the, and the owner is responsible for immediately taking action to make that condition safe. And I'll pass it back to Michelle to talk further about ownership responsibility. So a lot of people may be wondering, where do I start? What do I do with this information? If I live in a building, if I'm on a co-op board, if I'm in management, how do you keep ahead of this process and avoid potential fees or scheduling conflicts or that dreaded last minute rush to be you know, in um, to be up to date with your ordinances. I would highly recommend that everyone research and verify what cycle, what sub cycle your building is in and what its current status. Its current status would be whatever it was evaluated to be during cycle eight. 
So if you were cycle H, B, or C, um, the QEWI would have provided a swarm unsafe or hopefully safe um, review of your building. That will really help you plan for the future. Uh, if your building is currently swamped and you have not completed repairs, that's something that needs to be considered very promptly to make sure any necessary repairs can be corrected before the closing of the Cycle 9 window. If they don't, you risk potentially being reclassified as unsafe. Uh, buildings should also compile any relevant records, those being reports, prior filings, drawings, photographs of any work that was completed previously. Completed repairs to address warm conditions are particularly important so that they can be provided to any new consultants so that they're aware that conditions noted previously were completely and effectively addressed. And please do not wait till the last minute um, in order to get access, especially for the additional all-closed close surveys and probes, it's in everyone's best interest to plan in advance in order to have enough time to get access and have everything compiled and submitted before the due date. In summary, some of the more significant changes impacting the facade ordinance or FIS in New York City are the increase in the demand of close-up inspections, that being one for every 60 feet of the thought above public right-of-way, previously having been only one location. The addition of cavity wall probes, which applies to buildings with cavity wall systems only, and having at least one probe per close-up access site um, required. And the increase of civil penalties associated with those uh, unsafe conditions, late filings, and the notable addition of sidewalk shed fees that we have not previously encountered. For additional information, I highly recommend that you visit the DOB's website. In addition to information on the this program, um, owner manual and recommendations. They do have a list of all the QEWIs, so that would be the qualified exterior wall inspectors that have been approved and vetted by the DOB for the purposes of these surveys and these filings. A full list can be found on their website. And additional information can be found on the site, a site sponsored by WJE, facadeordinance.com. In addition to New York City ordinance, this website details various, audience, various ordinances throughout the United States. And thank you very much, everyone. All right, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Tom. As a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box and hit submit. If we don't get to your question during the call, we will follow, follow up with you afterward. So let's go ahead and take our first question. Has there been any discussion of moving, postponing, or delaying deadlines in light of everything going on in the city? Uh, yes, I can answer that. Th there has been um, uh, uh, information sent out by the Department of Buildings uh, but it's only uh, relative to cycle eight filings. Buildings that have not yet filed a cycle eight report have been given an amnesty period uh, to get those reports in. Um, nothing has changed regarding cycle nine, which started in February. Okay, our next question. My building is newer construction. How do we determine when our first filing is required? Uh, I can answer that. Um, the first filing for new construction buildings over six stories are that they require filing five years from the first issuance of a temporary certificate of occupancy. And that's something that can also be verified on the DOB website if you look through the certificate of occupancy. Whenever that first one was dated, um, your first filing is five years from then. However, if that 
first five years after falls outside of the cycle window, the 9A, 9B, 9C, um, what have you, if it's outside of that, it would require a filing in the next applicable two-year filing. So if your five years was now, but you're actually in cycle window B, then your first filing would be required in cycle B. Okay, our next question. How can we search New York City databases to determine the facade inspection status and obtain prior reports? Uh, yes, uh, the, the New York City Department of Buildings has uh, what's called the DOB Now Portal. Uh, this is a public website uh, where anyone can uh, go online and search uh, for a building by uh, that building's number and street name and which borough that building is in. Uh, and when that information is entered, it will pull up um, all of the previous uh, information that's available electronically. And typically that is the previous status of the building um, as well as some of the report. Um, I say some of the report because you won't have, the public does not have access to some of the supporting materials such as photographs or um, drawings that may have been submitted with that previous FISP report. Um, however, uh, the, the building status and uh, the the text from the report is available. All right, the next question is, how much does the financial ability of the building owners to make repairs play into the classification of the facade as swarm or unsafe? I can address that. Unfortunately, the building's status financially or otherwise has no impact on how the building is classified. The exterior condition of the building is what it is. So if a safe, if an unsafe condition or conditions requiring repair as determined by the QEWI are discovered, um, that, is, that is the determinant alone. Nothing else can be taken into uh, consideration. All right, our next question is, if an unsafe condition is found, would additional inspections be required, say 100% of the facade? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's usually going to be a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the qualified exterior wall inspector, um, as a responsible professional, uh, will have to consider this strongly depending on the severity of those conditions, um, how often they were they were observed. And yes, they may recommend to the owner that at the time that uh, the unsafe conditions are corrected, um, that additional inspections are, are performed. Um, oftentimes, there will be swarm conditions in addition to unsafe conditions on a given building. Uh, even though that filing is unsafe or that building status is unsafe, uh, it's a good time while correcting those unsafe conditions to also address the swarm conditions, in which case that would typically give you an access to a good amount of the facade, sometimes 100%. Okay, our next question is, could you please describe your sounding procedure? Yeah, sure. Um, generally, we use an acrylic hammer and we kind of lightly or more aggressively hammered, depending on the material um, at hand. Um, and place our hands on the building and, and kind of feel around. We both feel for any movement, um, vibration of underlying support, um, or just listen for sounds of delamination. It's very dependent on what the substrate at hand is. If you have something like a terracotta um, cast unit, sounding can be very helpful to show delamination of material, deterioration of um, anchor systems, uh, it, it's very much an acquired ability over time. Um, tr materials such as travertine have very unique sounding. Um, it's, it's evaluated material by material, but we try to get hands up, hands on and, and sound and hammer at everything we can access. Okay, our next question. Will the close-up inspection drops performed before February 2021 count towards cycle nine? Uh, well, the answer is maybe. Uh, it depends on whether you're in cycle 9A, 9B, or 9C. Uh, for example, 9A is a two-year window starting February of this year and running until 
uh, February of 2022. Um, however, uh, cycle 9B begins February 2021 and ends February 2023. Um, so essentially, uh, if the inspect if the building uh, is in cycle 9A, then yes. But if it's in 9B or C, then no. Okay. The next question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Are buildings at six stories or less? Aren't buildings at six stories or less just as dangerous as high rises? Is there any plan to extend this type of review to those buildings too? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I often feel that way that without additional ordinances, people sometimes um, don't make the effort to uh, maintain or survey their building. Um, there has been some talk about it uh, over the years, but currently I'm not aware of any structured ordinance requiring these inspections. Um, but I think that's something to educate the public and, and encourage these sort of active surveys so it would be very helpful. Okay, next question. If only a portion of my building has an area of brick veneer and the rest of my building is a different wall type, do I still need to do probes? Uh, the answer uh, is yes. Um, and the QEWI really, if, if, they're, if, if they're evaluating this building, they're going to want to look at all of the different uh, wall types. Um, and, you know, if I were inspecting a building and a portion of that building had had brick veneer or masonry veneer of any type, I would choose to do my close-up inspection on that material so I can get my close-up evaluation and file an accurate report. Next question. During repairs, is the inspector required to conduct inspections verifying that repairs are being made? Uh, yeah. Um, the. Uh, the one item we didn't go into a whole lot of detail on is that, yes, there are unsafe reports that are filed, uh, but then once those, those conditions are corrected, uh, an amended report is filed with the Department of Buildings to, to verify that those repairs were, were done. Um, and a part of those, those amended reports have to include photographs and documentation of the repairs that were performed in addition to uh, work permit numbers and, and all other sorts of documents uh, that would have been necessary. Uh, to, to get that work done. Okay, our next question. What is the sidewalk protection required during inspections? Touching, sounding, drilling, et cetera, will result in loose debris. I have had large chunks of stone and masonry break loose in my hands while performing rope access inspections. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, generally, work as classified as you know, repair work designated in file drawings requires sidewalk sheds, and oftentimes survey work is done without a sidewalk shed. Um, I think that that's something that should be discussed with an owner if there are specific conditions that, you know, there are concerns. Um, at minimum, I think sidewalks should always be closed off below any survey area to limit any potential falling of debris, material, or even just equipment that's held. Um, the sounding, we certainly do pull off miscellaneous pieces of, of material um, during survey work. Uh, the probes will be an interesting thing. I think the probes are going to be, have to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. If you had a facade where you had a large um, cavity wall cladding unit, such as a large travertine piece that needed to be removed to to fully inspect the underlying uh, cladding anchorage um, that might necessitate uh, a sidewalk shed or other safety provisions below. But if a probe can be done through um, a small hole in a mortar joint and reviewed through a boroscope, perhaps that is less invasive and would not require additional protection. Okay, our next question. Will the setback that is at the fifth floor attached to a tall building need close-up inspection at the lower floors as well? Uh, the, the answer is yes. Uh, bottom to top uh, is required, um, regardless of the number of setbacks 
uh, or balconies or, or what other what other kind of building features there are. Uh, yes, yeah, so it starts at, at grade and goes to the top. Okay. Well, that looks like that's all the questions that have been submitted today. If any of our audience members have other questions, please feel free to reach out to Michelle or Tom directly. Their contact information is on the screen and is also available on the left side of the audience console in the speaker bio section. We would really like to thank you for joining us. We hope it's been educational. You'll receive an email with a link to an on-demand version of this webinar that you can use to rewatch the presentation at your convenience or share with colleagues who are unable to join us today. And that link will also give you access to related resources, including a PDF copy of this presentation. The email will also include a link to download your certificate of participation. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to Tom, Michelle, or myself at lpimper at wj.com. Thank you so much for your time, and we hope you have a great rest of the day.